having me around. It's really good to be here and, and hear all the intros. Um, so you, like uh, Makoto said, uh, it will be like super interactive. So feel free to just unmute yourself or just put your hand up or uh, things like that. I have a, like a general presentation I can give, um, but I can skip through it depending on what everybody knows or doesn't know about RV and DeFi and lending and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, so maybe if, um, Maybe if you can put your hand up or say something if you've like used Aave for before for like lending and borrowing or depositing. Just as an end user. An yeah. end user, okay. Cool. All right. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I've used it as an end user as well, but yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right, well that's that, that's good good to know. A few people at least, and then so I can skip over some of the basic stuff then. Um, but yeah, a little bit background on me. Uh, so I've been, you know, startups and then crypto for, for, for a number of years now, uh, hacking on various things. Uh, probably at the start of this year, I joined Aave um, when we went to mainnet uh, at the start of the year. And since then, we've grown like crazy. Uh, and so that was, that seems like so long ago, but that was V1. And then now, now I'm actually on the cusp of V2. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so that should be happening very, very soon. Um, but let me find the screen I need to share. Uh, so I think you should be able to see this screen now. You can see the slides. Yep, cool. Uh, so yeah, all right, so we'll jump straight into it. Yeah, as I said before, feel free to interrupt and then put your hand up or whatever. Uh, if you want me to go slower or explain a certain aspect. Um, so for those that don't know, the, the history of um, Aave is that we started off as ETHLEND, so back in 2017, and that was basically a peer-to-peer -peer lending protocol. Um, but the problem with peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, um, and, and Allah, maybe you, you experienced this as well, is uh, at least in the ETHLEND sense, you had to match up you know, depositors uh, that wanted to lend out their money at a certain interest rate for a certain asset, to these borrowers that were willing to accept that certain asset or that certain interest rate. So then that's why we moved to more of the current model, which is around liquidity pools. Um, so essentially all the depositors, they deposit uh, funds into this liquidity pool uh, and the interest rates are set by parameters in the protocol. So depending on utilization, how popular certain assets are, the risk profile of certain assets, that determines the interest rate. Uh, and other uh, parameters. And then on the other side, we have borrowers. So borrowers, uh, they're the ones that, you know, at any time they can just uh, borrow whatever funds they need as long as it's available uh, on the protocol and they don't choose their interest rate. They just like take the interest rate, whatever is available at that time based on uh, protocol parameters. And, and one of the special things that I'll go through later as well is that we have, you know, stable interest rates and variable interest rates. So in normal, uh, or in other lending protocols, generally you just have a, a variable interest rate. Uh, we also have a stable interest rate, which uh, goes into what you mentioned before, Victor, around, uh, it's not necessarily fixed interest rates, um, but you can create, and some people have created fixed interest rate products out of our stable rates uh, product, which we can go through as well. Uh, and then uh, as, as, as you saw in the, the blurb, I mentioned multi-markets. So uh, in version one, we did sort of an MVP of the multi-market uh, for Uniswap. So that meant that uh, Uniswap LPs who had uh, deposited liquidity into Uniswap, they could use those LP tokens as collateral uh, to borrow like more funds and, and use it as they need. Um, so, so that was really a powerful thing. And that grew uh, quite quickly um, to a few million dollars, I think. Uh, worth of liquidity in that in that protocol um so so with v2 we're going to have like a, a, a another focus on this multi-market approach um where we'll have the main ave or the main market where most of the tbl is is locked in uh then also we'll have uh, other markets depending on certain risk profiles certain um other protocols like we've announced we'll have like a, a set protocol market um, or something with like physical real estate market, uh, white listed markets and things like that. Uh, and then, yeah, besides what I've mentioned already, uh, we have other aspects of the protocol, which, you know, you have the price feeds, we use Chainlink, uh, we have our liquidators, uh, which, you know, is permissionless. Anyone can join as a liquidator and then incentivized because they get discounted collateral 
uh, to liquidate positions when they're in danger. So that helps the safety of the protocol. Uh, then also, of course, we have our, our bunch of hundreds of integrators around the world that just build on top of the protocol. So currently, uh, I just updated these slides today. Uh, so the, the market size is about 1.9 billion. Uh, we've grown pretty crazily, uh, getting pretty close to 2 billion in total value lot. Uh, and then also we have, uh, I have here the, the uh, staked Aave. So we recently released uh, the state staking of the Aave token. So we currently have nearly $250 million uh, of Aave staked. Um, so that's separate to the TVL. Uh, and I'll go through why people will stake. Um, but the important aspect of that is that they stake and they earn, you know, of course, some yield. Um, but in a way, they're, they're becoming the backstop for the protocol. So uh, creating another safety layer. Uh, in case of uh, uh, whatever event happens in the protocol, sort of like an insurance fund for a protocol in a way. All right, so the, the major uh, protocol features is that we have uh, earning, uh, depositing, uh, and, and the main thing uh, that's different here with uh, Aave, uh, both in V1 and V2, is that we had A tokens. So A tokens are your, uh, uh, are your tokenized deposits. So if you deposit funds into the protocol, you receive uh, the same amount of funds, but as A tokens, and those A tokens are interest bearing. So similar to RDI, um, you know, the, the, they will just keep uh, increasing in interest. Uh, so you'll see it in your wallet and it just keeps increasing. So it's, wait, this is then a pretty big change then from V1 where you would increment your, your balance with A tokens. Sorry, no, no, it's, it's the same. It's the same as V1. Gotcha. So, so you earn if you earn 1%, if you deposited 100 and you earn 1%, you get one more A token or the 100 A tokens that you originally have are now worth $1 and one cent each? Uh, no, so, so let's say you deposit 100, uh, uh, yeah, a die, you get uh, 100 A die in return, um, but each second uh, you that, that interest will accrue. So you'll see your A token balance increasing each yeah, time you, you do the balance. To 101. A die and each A die is worth exactly one die. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you can redeem that at any time. Um, so that's that's pretty powerful. From a UX perspective, it makes it a lot easier to for you end users to understand exactly how much interest they've earned or, or how much they actually have. Uh, for borrowing, as I mentioned, we have rate switching, which I'll go through some code examples, uh, switching between stable and, and variable interest rates. Of course, credit delegation, flash loans and governance, which are, are much larger topics that I'll dive into. Uh, currently in the main market, so Aave V1 market, uh, we have more than 20 assets. Uh, and then also, of course, multi-markets, uh, which at the moment includes the MVP uh, Uniswap market. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're probably one of the lending protocols with the most uh, assets um, that are available. All right, so let's go next. So, so normally I do these slides for like a generally a non-technical audience. Um, but I think we're, we're generally sort of all DeFi technical people. So I skipped to the last ELI, which is explained like I'm, you know, five years I would explain like I'm, you know, a DeFi person. Um, so as, as I mentioned, we essentially tokenize your deposits. So you get the A tokens and the interest accrues immediately. So the, the example code, this is, so all this code, by the way, and this whole presentation is from V2. Uh, so it's, you know, fully updated. V2 is currently on uh, Coven, so you can play with it. Uh, and uh, pretty soon it will be on mainnet. Um, and, and I'm sure you'll hear about that on Twitter and in other media uh, when that happens. So the, the, the main part here uh, from, from a developer technical perspective is like any ERC20 token, you approve uh, our lending pool to be able to you know, uh, take those tokens from your account. And then you just call the deposit function. So you just say, I want to deposit this asset uh, for this amount. Uh, and we have an on behalf of uh, parameter now. So you can deposit on behalf of someone else. That means that they receive the A tokens. So you deposit your funds in then someone else will essentially receive the, the tokenized um, uh, the tokenized deposit plus they'll earn the interest as well on that. And of course a referral code. Um, so the powerful thing about the on behalf in this circumstance is that you can use, uh, let's say you can use a hot wallet to deposit and your cold wallet can hold those A tokens. Um, so the, the, for, for a lot of institutionals, uh, that's, that's quite a useful thing to do. 
it makes if of course when you want to withdraw the tokens uh, you just simply call withdraw on the learning pool and you can also say where you want to withdraw that to so you don't have to withdraw it to the message sender you can withdraw it to whatever account whether it's your cold wallet or give it to someone else um, you could probably create some uh, creative mechanisms around here I right, can I ask a question fun. yeah sure yeah uh, can you go one step back yeah so when you do deposit on behalf of for example I'm the hot wallet calling this function right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if I'm doing on behalf of cold wallet I don't have the value right so how do I do it on behalf but, of the cold wallet? so so this is like sort of depositing on behalf of so that yeah. means like you're depositing on, on their behalf, but they, they get the A tokens. Um, but in this case, you would have- Oh, so Hot, hot Wallet does have the asset and I put it, but the beneficiary of the interest goes somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, exactly. okay. Beneficiary of the interest and the tokenized deposit. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. So on that same, same question, um, the interaction between this slide and the next one, who, who is able to call withdraw? Is it the Hot Wallet that initially deposited um, do they still retain kind of control over the deposit and withdrawal decisions, or is it the holder of the A tokens, in this case, the cold wallet? That's a, a very good question. Um, I have to double check that in the code. Um, but but uh, yeah, let, let me, let me have to, I'll double check that and, and probably get back to you on that one. My assumption uh, is that it's the regional, uh, the hot wallet. Right, but let me let me double check that. Don't yeah, we'll, we'll check the code first. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, so this you can withdraw to, to another address. Um, uh, the difference here, sorry, also in v in v two, that's different from v one. In case you've used v one, is that v one we had ETH, uh, the non ERC version, uh, ERC twenty version, and everything else is ERC twenty. Now we're using uh, uh, wrapped ETH, so now everything's ERC, uh, which should make things a bit easier and less. I guess if statements around transferring, um, so yeah, you all, you always need to do the approval uh, when depositing. All right, so for borrowing, I mean, yeah, hopefully you all understand what borrowing is. Essentially, uh, you deposit some sort of collateral. Uh, you, you deposit into the into the protocol. You receive the A tokens, which you can use as collateral, and you can borrow any of the supported assets uh, at, at either variable stable interest rate. So. In code, it looks very similar to the um, depositing function. So you simply call borrow. You want to borrow this asset for this amount. Uh, the interest rate mode, we have stable and variable. So stable is simply one uh, and variable is two. So just pass that in the parameter. Then you have referral code and you have a on behalf of as well. So this is the, the powerful part here is that uh, this is where um, uh, credit delegation uh, comes into play, which, which I'll have a a separate section about this as well. So for now, we'll leave that, um, but we'll, we'll come back to that later on. So that's borrowing. Uh, any questions around that? Borrowing. I think it should be straightforward enough. Uh, then of course we have the. So what, when you when you borrow, when you do the borrow, you can you say what uh, interest rate mode you want, stable variable interest rate, and at any time you can also switch the interest rate. Uh, so you know if you if you did a borrow in in a, as a variable. Uh, borrow you can easily switch it to stable borrow which is quite useful um because you know depending on the market sometimes a I mean, stable will be better to to have can you can you talk a little bit about how the stable uh rate is set and is it is it permanent if you if you started borrowing something and you elected interest rate model equals one stable debt mm -hmm. um and let's call it five percent is the stable rate at that time is that you have that in perpetuity or does it get reset under some circumstances or what differentiates stable from fixed yeah so so uh in v2 specifically uh, i mean this the the risk uh alexander from from our risk team should know a lot more about this but um in v2 specifically and i guess stable rates now but more so v2 the stable rates are essentially for as as long as as long as you need them um, in v1 uh, it was it was a bit different in that there's some edge cases where there'll be a sort of a forced uh, let's say a forced um, uh, re-indexing of the interest rates uh, for, for certain uh, uh, stables stable borrowers um, or stable interest rates um, but as far as I understand in v2 uh, you can essentially lock in uh, 
you're right. Is that, is uh, that the, going to be the same on the, on the lending side as well? When you loan assets, it's going to be the same sort of mechanism for stable uh, loan rates? Uh, so you mean deposit, like, the, like your, your, the, the interest you make? Uh, no, no, there's no, at the moment, there's no um, sort of fixed income interest rate uh, or loan rates. Uh, but, you know, there's been people that have, have created those products on top of it, uh, where some, some devs, they'll do something like, you know, you get upfront interest or fixed rate APY, uh, you know, then, but it's lower than normal deposit you get because they, they, they would do some market mechanism. Um, I thought that was part of the V2 roadmap was to have the stable lending rate product to sort of match the stable borrowing rate product. Is that not, did I get that wrong? Uh, potentially. I, I haven't had visibility on that. Okay. Um, uh, I, uh, sounds familiar, but I can't, I, I, yeah, I, I'd only say if I know for sure. Um, so for me, from, from my end, I'll say that that's not, uh, yeah, at least in the first release, uh, of V2, the initial release of V2. So then, uh, good questions by the way. Um, so that's the stable variable interest rates. Um, I think that's pretty pretty straightforward there. Uh, the, uh, the other thing with V2 that's different from V1 is that uh, the the debts, uh, so the, the borrows, they are tokenized as well. So we have A tokens that are tokenized um, collateral, and now we have debt tokens. Uh, tokenized debt. Um, so it should be a lot easier to keep an accurate ledger of, you know, your debts and whatever else. Uh, and and that's also, that also plays into the uh, credit delegation and, and whatever else that I'll talk about later. Uh, repaying your loan, uh, also pretty similar. You know, you approve the lending pool. Uh, in, v, in V2, we only have the lending pool address that you need to work with. Previously, uh, with the V1, there was lending pool and lending pool core. Um, so now you just need to work the lending pool, which simplifies things a bit more. So repaying, same deal, you just repay an asset, certain amount. Uh, you have to say what interest rate you're repaying because the debt tokens, the, the debt is tokenized. So you're saying that I want to repay this stable debt or I want to repay this uh, variable uh, interest rate debt. Uh, and then, of course, you can repay on behalf of someone else. All right. Uh, so question. Yep. So in interest rate mode oh okay interest rate mode is set either when either only when you lend or when you uh, repay but you don't have to specify when you borrow what you do specify so no so so when when you borrow you say whether you want a stable interest rate uh, or yeah. a variable interest then, rate so and then, then when you deposit, you don't, you don't specify because it's yeah. at the moment, there's only that one. So you need to specify the mode for borrowing and the repaying. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're borrowing. Uh, cause you... Isn't that re redundant? Because you, if you do in one mode in borrowing, certainly you have to repay in the same mode or can you actually switch the mode when you borrow yeah, so it's, and repay? Exactly. So the, spe so the special thing with uh, V2 is that you can, uh, have two separate borrows. So you can, let's say I borrow die, I can have a stable die borrow and also a variable die borrow. So that's why when you repay, you're, you're saying I'm repaying the stable die borrow and I want to keep the variable die borrow. Uh, hi, uh, hi, hi. So well, let, yep. let's say I borrow die, um, 10 die at variable. Can I switch yep. that same debt 10 die um, variable borrow to fixed? Or I, yeah. I need to take out a new position. No, no. So you can you can change it, uh, swap it to uh, the stable uh, borrow. Okay. Um, you can do that back and forth, however, as many times as you want. Um, but what we're, what we're talking about here is that um, you can have both at the same time, right? So you can have like fifty die worth of variable interest rate and and uh, hundred uh, die worth of a stable. Uh, borrow because it's tokenized i'm thinking about like gaming this like if you take an asset let's imagine there's no real market for it right and and so the rates are quite low there's like almost zero lending or deposit interest and let's call it two percent borrow wouldn't it make sense if you think you might ever want to borrow that asset to just open up 
a stable debt amount and then are you able to add to that stable debt amount at the same rate later? Like let's assume at time one, the borrow rate on stable is 2% and then at time two, it's gonna be 40% because all of a sudden there's a huge market for it. Could you just open it with let's call it $10 worth of the asset at time one at 2% and then just like flood in a ton of money to borrow it continually at 2% going forward, or do you still have to pay the rate that the stable debt is at time two when you borrow? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, I'm pretty sure that because uh, this is the similar uh, in V1, the way it works is that if you take another uh, like borrow of the same uh, of stable, then it re-indexes like, the stable rate. Gotcha. So it's not something where you can kind of open and have this permanent vehicle of a crazy low rate and then like leverage. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's more like if you if you take a loan and you have the crazy low rate and you don't do anything with it, and then like then you keep that crazy low rate. Um, but if you you need to take more of a stable loan, yeah, because that, that would be a, a pretty big attack vector. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, for a lot of yield farmers, you know, they love this uh, stable rate stuff because you know they they can plan. You know, okay, I'm going to borrow X amount for a year, and I know I can cap. That's the, I know how much interest I'm going to pay. Uh, and then, you know, they do the yield farming, you know, they, they ensure they're in profits. Um, so, yeah, it's been used in the wild quite quite a bit. Uh, right, so, so we'll move to the credit delegation now. Uh, so, uh, let's say in, in uh, what I've talked about so far is, you know, you deposit and you uh, deposit some collateral in a system, then also you can borrow funds, um, but generally that's from the same account. Uh, with credit delegation, you can separate the two. So you have one person that deposits into the protocol and another person that borrows. Um, so what that enables is that the borrower is essentially taking an uncollateralized loan uh, because uh, it, it's essentially a permission, uh, in a way, a permissioned loan because the, the, the person that deposited the collateral in the protocol, they will say, uh, this person can uh, use my credit, right? And uh, you can do it via smart contracts, you can do it through off-chain legal agreements or however you want, um, uh, and you, you enforce that how you want. You know, so let's say if, if let's say I, ha I have a son uh, and I wanna give him a credit line, you know, and I'll just enforce that in the house and I'll just say, hey, like you have to pay back <laughs> that loan. Um, or, uh, you know, if you're a business and you're doing a B2B transaction, you'll probably have a legal agreement that says, okay, you have to pay me, X amount of interest on top of whatever interest we've borrowed at, uh, and we're going to enforce it through the court system or something like that. Um, so that's a pretty powerful uh, thing. What's what's the upside of doing it that way versus just having people pull down their assets off of Ave and separately loan them out if it requires all that sort of separate trusted agreement? Like, what's the upside of just being able to use Ave to essentially just do the uh, effectuate the transfer of the funds essentially? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it, it, there's, a, there's a few, I guess, parts to that. What, one would be, um, let's say, access to, to the protocol. Uh, so that includes like, the security of the protocol, the interest rates of the protocol. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to do it peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So uh, as an example, uh, Yearn Finance, they have a link vault. And that link vault actually uses credit delegation from V1. Um, so you can do it from a smart contract sense. So the smart contract can deposit collateral, you know, and then they can delegate that credit to another smart contract that maybe has some uh, profit farming strategies, right? Um, so so yeah, you can do it programmatically. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think there'll be like, you know, the, just like you know, custody of funds, uh, security, that, that those sort of things. Gotcha. So, so when... You, in case of young finance, the benefit is that they don't have to switch around the assets because they are kind of delegating within their trusted smart contract, right? So they can actually, they don't actually have need to delegate if they just actually literally moving around the uh, fund. But because that could cost more gas or something, is that why they delegate? Um, it would more be like, let's say, uh, let's say some, some, like, let's say one contract, it's a very safe farming contract. Um, and it would deposit some assets on Aave, then it would just get the interest rate, highest die interest rate. 
possible. Um, and it's just earning that interest rate. And it doesn't need to borrow because it's a safe strategy, right? But it has, has this borrowing capability that it's not using, right? Um, so then it can sort of delegate that, that uh, borrowing capability to another contract and that other contract can you know, make use of that, those assets. Um, it, of course, ensuring if, if the, both the contracts are both ensuring that you know, it never goes underwater, and it doesn't take too much um, borrows. Uh, but let, let's say if, the, if, the, if some vault has like $20 million uh, worth of assets in it, it can probably safely borrow, let's say, you know, five to $10 million. Right? And if it keeps track of the safety margin, then you know it can increase its its interest uh, or yield uh, quite quite dramatically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's uh, at, at the moment, I, as far as I'm aware, it's uh, with the, one of the uh, Yearn vaults. I think Ylink or Yarlink, uh, they do that. I'm not sure if other vaults, um, but I know Andre is pretty excited for V2 credit delegation because uh, it's a lot better than than the V1 credit delegation uh, because this is native credit delegation. It's in the protocol. So, so going to the code, um, when I say native, it's like basically you call it on the individual tokens. So um, let's say for, uh, to do it, essentially you, we have a, um, you say a data provider here. So, and these contracts are all available on our docs, um, but you can get the, the token addresses associated with certain assets. Uh, and then let's say this, we wanna say, we wanna borrow, uh, we wanna delegate, uh, the stable, uh, stable debt, uh, then we can choose, you know, who we want to delegate that to, and we can cap the amount. So we can say this person or this contract can borrow a maximum of whatever amount. Uh, and you can tell them like, okay, they can only borrow at stable rate or they can only borrow at the variable uh, rate. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. From the, uh, from the, so, so that's the um, delegator. So that's approving someone and setting their limit. And then from the borrower perspective, the borrower uh, can interact directly if they want uh, with our lending pool or with a main Aave contract. And so they just call like they would call any other borrower and they just say, you wanna borrow this asset, da, 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 this amount uh, at this interest rate. Um, and then they'll say on behalf of the delegator, the person that delegated it to them. Um, so that's, that's where this comes into play. Um, so, so that's, and, and because the, the debt is tokenized, in this case, the, 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 uh, the debt tokens would be incurred on the, on behalf of address. Yeah, Victor, did you have a question? So I was just going to confirm, it sounds like you guys are not planning to build your own module to sort of regulate the, the payback conditions and enforce liquidations and this kind of thing for people that don't you know, if you do credit delegation, it's, you're describing scenarios so far where you've got external arrangements and external um, operations or contracts that are, that are um, enforcing how the debt is paid back. It sounds like you're, you're not saying that Aave's at least immediate V2 plans are to build something within the site where an end user can say, I wanna deposit this much die and I wanna make it available to credit delegation and get paid back, you know, all through in the Aave protocol. It would still require kind of some other extension, right? Yeah, so as far as I'm aware, um, in the initial release, uh, yeah, this is more just like, you know, for, for hackers and, and devs to like build stuff out of it. Um, I think in the future, um, maybe there'll be something in the front end. Um, but of course, you know, this is like, it'd be pretty dumbed down for, you know, end users to do it really simply and not, you know, lose funds and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah. Cool. So that's, uh, yep. So the delegating has debt there. Um, I was going to say something else. I think I forgot. Yeah. So uh, another one, uh, I think just to highlight in case, um, it's not properly understood is that from the Aave protocol perspective, this looks just like a normal deposit and borrow. Uh, so the liquidator network, they're still like, if this loan comes in danger, the liquidators can still take that collateral of the delegator. Um, so it's up to the delegator, you know, to ensure that, you know, their loan is repaid. Um, otherwise, you know, their collateral is at, at stake. All right, so, uh, and for repaying, essentially anyone can repay the delegator's debt. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but maybe there's use cases for that. Um, but generally the, the person that borrowed 
the the funds, uh, or let's say the uncollateralized loan, uh, they would put the delegator's address on behalf of. Um, so that's simply how you. That's how we keep accounting uh, of it. Um, so I just saw there's a typo here. Um, so, so there's uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward uh, in this sense uh, from a code perspective. It's more about I guess um, wrapping your head around uh, sort of how how things interact. Um, that's that's more of the hard part. All right. Uh, so that's credit delegation. Uh, if no other questions, we'll move to flash loans. Um, cool. So for flash loans, we won't have to read all of this. Um, but maybe the interesting part for for uh, finance people, or they have a finance background, it's essentially not exactly, but it's essentially an unsecured fixed term loan, which is about fifteen seconds because that's the Ethereum block time, or let's say fourteen seconds, uh, with a very low fixed interest rate. So at the moment, the interest rate is zero point zero nine percent. That the bank, let's say the EVM or the Aave protocol, can always collect at expiry. So that's at the end of the transaction. And and the way that works is that uh, essentially if you don't repay back the flash loan by the end of the transaction, then the transaction just reverts, it fails, and it's like nothing ever happened. Um, so that's that's quite magical. It's been like in the wild for a, you know a year now, and I'm sure you've probably heard in the media some good and bad things about flash loans. Um, I'll go through some examples here of flash loans. So the important part here is that everything above the purple line uh, happens, uh, definitely happens on chain. So this is where you pay the gas costs for and everything below the purple line can potentially get reverted uh, if you don't repay back the flash loan. So in this case, uh, this is a, a real example of, let's say a borrower or a smart contract. It calls the flash loan function and it says, I want to borrow, I don't know, a million die. Uh, then the, the protocol contracts do some sanity checks if everything checks out, sort of like, is there enough liquidity and all that, is there a valid asset and things like that. Uh, then it sends that million die to that, to the borrower and the borrower does essentially whatever they want with the, that million die. Uh, so in this case, the borrower uses that die, it uh, pays back a debt of a CDP, let's say make a vault or a compound position or even an Aave position. So in, in V1, you couldn't use flash loans within Aave. In V2, you can use it within the Aave protocol um, and it's used extensively throughout the protocol. So that, that pay, like you pay back your loan position essentially, then you liquidate the collateral. Uh, and then you, in the same transaction, you can sell some of that collateral on you know, Uniswap or SushiSwap. Uh, and then that's how you get the day back to pay back the, the debt. Um, and some people ask, you know, why would you want to do that? Um, the reason is that uh, in this specific example, you don't need to have the uh, the money that you owe uh, at hand because um, sometimes maybe you've spent that money or you have that money somewhere else. Um, but this is essentially you're you're taking the collateral that's underneath to repay back the the loan. Um, so that's quite a powerful thing. It is basically like a few transactions in one. Uh, so that's. And you know people do this in various use cases like arbitrage as well, and they make some profit, and you know that profit gets sent to that they get to keep all that profit uh, as long as the the debt and the small fee is paid. Any questions so far on that schematic? Oh, cool. Uh, so for uh, V two flash loans, as I mentioned, it's uh, used throughout the protocol. So we have collateral and debt swaps, like I just mentioned in that diagram where you can swap your collateral or swap your debt uh, in V2, that, that's possible. The, the new feature in V2 specifically is that we allow batch flash loans, um, which uh, um, Fiona on Twitter called um, flash loan buffet, which I quite like. Um, so you can batch flash loans. So the, I just did an example here of, of two assets, but you can, I think Fiona did one where she, she batched flash loan like all the assets that were available. Um, so instead of doing you know, multiple flash loan transactions, you can say, you know, flash loan me 10 different assets and of all these differing amounts of, you know, various modes. Uh, and then uh, you do whatever you want with them. And then you pay back those loans, uh, which, is, which is a pretty powerful feature uh, in that it, it, it uh, let's say the example, one example would be that let's say the market is suddenly dropping 
uh, but you have 20 different loans outstanding on all these different protocols. Uh, so with one sort of transaction, you'll be able to close all those loans uh, using something like flash loans um, because you know you just flash loan all these different assets and in one transaction, everything will be closed. Um, so that's, that's just a pretty straightforward example. Yep. Uh, before we couldn't, you couldn't do that? No, before you have to do one flash loan at a time. That means one flash loan at one, one transaction. You can't call uh, two flash loans in the one same transaction. Uh, you'd have to call the flash loan and wait for that one to finish within that transaction and then call it again, um, which you know, has a sort of associated gas costs and whatever else. Um, but this is just a more efficient uh, way of doing it. I see. Yeah. The, the other um, important thing to highlight here, which I should have highlighted, uh, is that uh, with now with flash loans, you have this, uh, these modes that you can call. So what this means is that, especially with uh, batch loans like this, you can, uh, if you use mode zero, that means that it's like a traditional flash loan, like in V1. Um, but also you can use the values one or two. So that means that for some of these uh, flash loans that you take, you can say, I'm going to repay it back by the end of the transaction. For other parts of the loan, you can say, oh, actually, I want to incur a stable debt or I want to incur a variable debt. Um, so that, that can be quite powerful. And that can also be used in credit delegation as well. So you could, uh, theoretically, someone could create like a credit delegation DAP um, where you know you delegate a certain amount to some contract and it only ever uses sort of flash loans um, and if something goes wrong then maybe it just incurs this stable debt um, on, on the delegator um, so yeah this, this sort of the design space for this is huge um, I think when when the core devs develop this is is more like you know let's let's try and keep it as flexible and as wide as possible um, we don't necessarily know the exact use cases um, but that's what happened with you know flash loans initially, and then you know people started creating really cool stuff. Uh, so, what one of the use case I was interested in is like uh, I was looking into one uh, arbitrage for example of the index corp. That like you know index corp is the mm -hmm. index fund of the like five or six different assets, and mm -hmm. uh, he was doing the ar uh, arbitrage of the uh, the index token price and all the sum of the underlying assets. So mm -hmm. if you want to do that arbitrage in that V1 flash loan, you only borrow one asset from Arbe, then mm -hmm. you convert back to all six underlying assets and then buy and put mm -hmm. it back. But with this one, can you actually borrow like six different assets in one yeah. flash loan call? Yeah, exactly. So that's what that's what this uh, the bash flash line is for. Yeah. So you can see here the assets. You, they, it can be all separate addresses. So you can do like a you can have Dai and MKR and Ave and I don't know whatever else assets you want. So in this case, I can save the basically compared to just borrow one asset and the exchange it all by myself. I can actually eliminate the exchange cost of like a. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. That's powerful. Exactly. Yeah. On that same sort of train of thought, this is something I had a half question about a while back and now it's kind of grown to a full question is, you know, um, Abe does have, you know, 20, 20 assets listed um, for borrowing. You know, th there are other protocols that are a little bit more loose about how quickly they're adding assets. Like I'm thinking of Cream in particular, um, yeah. tends to sort of, uh, you know, have you been live on mainnet for eight hours? Okay, we add you, kind of that, that attitude about it. And to the extent that, you know, Makoto's scenario, right, that's specifically related to a certain number of, um, you know, the index products that are in, I think, the DPI. And I think there are a couple of them that may not be on Aave right now, but whether or not they are, just do you, can you talk a little bit about Aave's attitude about how to add assets, what the kind of thresholds are for, for including them and, you know, sort of what the lead time is for when you start looking at something and when you add it, or is it, is it going to sort of, yeah, if you just talk about that, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So, so at the moment, uh, I mean, I was going to talk about this later, but we can talk about it now is, uh, so we have governance and we have a path towards decentralization. And we recently handed over the admin keys to the community um, for V1. And we're going to have the same process for V2, where it's a gradual decentralization. Um, so the way it works at the moment is that uh, the community, for, let's say for V1, the community will uh, talk about certain assets and suggest a certain listing. There'll be some sort of 
signaling vote. And then if it goes through, uh, then there'll be like a formal, what we call an AIP, an RV Improvement, Protocol, uh, uh, RV improvement uh, Proposal, uh, to list you know, whatever new assets. Uh, and, and part of that process of listing those new assets, our risk team and maybe others in the community will discuss you know, what parameters uh, should be involved. So for certain assets, you know, we might, the LTV, which is the loan to value ratio, which basically means you, for, for this amount of collateral you put up of this asset, you can borrow only this amount. You know? So if it's more risky, you, borrow, you can only borrow less, um, but if it's you know, more stable, you can borrow much more. So the risk team and the community will decide on, on those uh, parameters as well. Um, so that, that's how we envision it to work. And for V2, that's also how it works. The special thing about V2 is that we'll be able to move a lot faster because uh, it's a lot easier to um, create multiple markets on Aave V2. Uh, so the, the, the general sort of plan that we're heading towards is that we'll have you know, the main Aave TBL uh, market, which is similar to the V1 market, you know, with top tier assets, then we might have like a tier two, tier three uh, markets, or we might have a degen market of like just, you know, that, that sort of stuff. So, uh, I mean, ultimately it's up to the community to you know, elect what they want, but I'm sure someone in the community probably wants a degen market. Um, and of course there's, you know, associated risk and reward uh, with that sort of stuff. Thanks. That's right. Yeah, but that, but you bring up a good point. That will be really fascinating when when we get many different markets and you start flash learning from all these different markets. So I'm keen to see what gets created. Um, so so okay. So going back to the code. So so essentially, uh, with flash loans, um, because it's more of a developer tool, you have to have your own contract, right? You can't just call it as an end user. And so you create your own contract. You do the your flash loan call with you know all the relevant parameters. This is just a continuation of the previous screen. Uh, and then on lending pool, you on you just call flash loan on our lending pool and pass in all those parameters. Uh, yep, and these are all self-explanatory parameters. Uh, the receiver address would be like you know, what what uh, address will receive that flash loan assets. So it most likely it will be this same contract that has the same logic, but for whatever reason, you might have another contract that has all that business logic. Uh, and then next, uh, once, once uh, the our lending pool does the sanity checks and everything checks out, then it will send those assets that you requested uh, to the receiver address. And the receiver address, uh, let's say if it's the same contract as the previous screen, you need to have the execute operation uh, method. Um, so it has to be this exact signature because uh, you know our lending pool will just call this method, uh, and then this. Another thing that's special or different with V2 is that now with V2, we actually pull the funds uh, back. Uh, so you need to set approvals, the relevant approvals. In uh, V1, you needed to transfer those funds back. Um, so this, this is partly uh, both like a convenience thing, uh, it makes it easier uh, for, for both parties. Uh, and, but then also at the same time, it's, uh, it, it helps uh, reduce the attack vectors um, with, with flash loans and things like that. So that's one of the reasons why uh, now we can use flash loans a lot throughout the protocol and we allow everyone else to use it to you know, do whatever they need to do. Uh, so that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, now this is an example for those that haven't seen a flash loan in action. This is the example I gave before. Uh, I created, a, I have a um, side project called Collateral Swap uh, at the, the start of this year, uh, and that's essentially what it does. So it, you can see it, um, it uh, does a flash loan from the Arbe lending pool, and then it, it closes down a MakerDAO vault, it repays back that collateral, then it releases uh, the funds. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, a uh, let's call it a DeFi management transaction using flash loans. Uh, we also have, of course, the, the arbitrage between different decentralized exchanges. Uh, here, they, they made a small profit of, I think, three cents or something. Um, but you, you can see that, you know, if you make uh, sort of millions of dollars, you can do million dollar arbitrage transactions and make uh, quite quite a good amount. Very competitive, though. Uh, and then finally, uh, here's an example of what batch flash loans uh, look like. Uh, this is currently on Coban only. 
so yeah, basically you get uh, you get sent a bunch of all the assets that you just requested, uh, and then you know you do whatever you want with it, and then by the end of it, you have to pay back what you borrowed plus the fee. All right. So how are we doing on time? We have got ten minutes. Uh, yeah. yeah, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. Um, cool. So I'll quickly go through governance. I touched on this topic already. Uh, from I guess for this call specifically in a more technical sense, um, we, as we have a path towards decentralization where token holders will upgrade the protocol or help upgrade the protocol and decide asset listings and whatever else. Uh, what's implemented right now, I mentioned, uh, is the, the staking contract. So we have more than $250 million staked. Uh, how that works is here, you can see there's a safety module um, and that's a backswap module. So at the moment, slashing is not implemented. So people uh, are getting interest from staking uh, for free, essentially. Um, but soon uh, the, the slashing will be implemented um, where, or not, not slashing, but let's say the, the penalty, uh, where if, if something happens and then, you know, you, you, you like sort of incur this loss or incur some sort of penalty. Um, so that's essentially the backstop. That's sort of the, one of the last um, mechanisms to, to ensure or save the protocol. Uh, if something happens, is this we have three, oh, sorry. Is it basically Nexus Mutual, but you have it on your own? Um, I'm not exactly sure how exactly Nexus Mutual works. Um, right. I don't, I don't, I don't think it is. It's more closer to my probably Maker Maker DAO. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So actually. that's how Maker when they they crashed back in March, they basically they minted. Well, I, I mean, oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, yeah, so Maker has like a different uh, mechanism, but essentially they, you know, they're, 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 uh, you buy the Maker tokens and you know that you're going to get uh, inflated, like there's going to be inflation if something bad happens, um, if you're not governing the protocol properly. So same with here, you stake your Aave, assuming that you're going to, you know, be participate and help govern the protocol. And if something bad happens, let's say there's, we listed risky assets too fast and then it's the uh, Aave stakers that will suffer the consequences um, in this what, case. How, how programmatic is that? Or is that subject to a governance vote? Or is it something, because in, in Maker, it automatically triggers when the system is under collateralized. And yeah. is this, does this have a similar programmatic trigger? And, and where is that? How can that be monitored? Uh, no, so, so at the moment, there's no uh, programmatic trigger. Um, as far as I understand, uh, it, it, it will be done through uh, I think that mechanism is probably still to be worked out exactly. I mean, because these are, these are part of the upgrades. So once once we enable um, the let's call it slashing or enable the penalty, uh, you know that will go to governance and it'll have to be you know the protocol will need to be upgraded. Like this this piece of code will need to uh, be be made live. Um, and you can see here that the reason why you know how does how do you earn interest? It comes from you know the fees from the markets. You know, there's also going to be an ecosystem reserve. Um, so there's various mechanisms that are quite different from uh, current V1. Um, and then this is good, good dives into a bit, a bit more where there'll be different mechanisms. So you can stake purely Aave or you can stake um, if you're a liquidity provider on, on balance that we have a balancer pool um, that you can also stake. Uh, that, 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 that's, that's interesting, is it? Um... Well, is it like um, what was the decision behind the balancer pools? Is it the private nature or the smart pools? Like, why did you choose to go for balancer pools? I think with balancer pools, you can um, it's that you can choose the uh, portion. Let's say twenty percent okay. ETH and eight percent Aave. That that played a big part, um, so, and then also the balancer rewards. So here that, you know, the, the, the balance uh, LPs, they will receive both balance of tokens, uh, balance of rewards, and also trading fees. So the APY should be quite uh, high, right? Because the safety okay, model uh, only works if there's a lot of funds staked. Um, so that's what we wanted to encourage. Okay, and, and how, did you, how did you arrive at that 80-20? Is that, yeah, how did you arrive at that 80-20? Is it pre based on like, a, is it based on like a constant product or? How do how do you arrive? Uh, I'm not I'm not exactly sure on how, how the risk team uh, arrived on this because they, they they came to this conclusion. Um, but I know part of the calculus was to uh, reduce any sort of like impermanent loss um, uh, for for the LPs uh, and this 
seem to be the best solution. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also the one which still can't head, put my head around that. Why? So for most people do that as part of kind of eel, eel farming to put some liquidity on the Aave itself. But you, Aave doesn't have enough liquidity on, so, like, you know, so that people can trade Aave easily. But in case of Aave, you already have like enough proper liquidity in Uniswap or any exchange. So why would you put your own liquidity using this balance? Well, I think part, part of this um, was that rather than just staking, let's say here, rather than just staking purely Aave and like locking it in the safety module, you can stake it in the safety module, which actually puts it into a, a balancer pool, which actually provides utility to traders, right? It provides liquidity. Whereas, you know, this, this staked Aave that's over, locked over here, it's like you, it's not, you're sort of taking liquidity out of the, out of the system. Uh, so to have, there. okay, rather than just doing nothing, at least yeah, have course. a slight, this amount is better than no amount, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, yeah, so part, partly the rewards, it helps with API, but then also it actually provides utility to the ecosystem. Right? It helps provide more um, balance, I guess, well, to, to the trading. What, 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 I, what I don't get, and it's probably a uh, more of a balancer thing than an RV thing, is how to, um, the, the, the equilibrium in that 80 20 pool. So what happens when someone makes a trade? How does it adjust? How does it adjust the pricing? Like it's, a, it's, it's, it's probably, it's probably um, a more of a balancer thing than an AVE thing. Because like, because like we've been yeah. trained to think, think in Uniswap terms, that looks yeah. ridiculous, but uh, there's probably a, some, yeah, it's more, it's more of a, it's more of a balancer question. Um, but uh, as far as I understand, it's uh, ar ar arbitrators or bots that will essentially uh, keep, keep that ratio. And it also makes you less exposed to changes in the ETH price. It's more focused on Aave there. So if you had a 50-50 yeah. yeah, yeah. pool and ETH goes crazy one way or the other, you know, it's, it's, there's more impermanent loss. Whereas since everybody is involved in the Aave system to use that pool, it's, it's not a big deal that it's, it's heavily weighted to Aave. It's yeah. less of an impact. On yeah, 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 but, yeah, but um, if the price of Aave tanks, there's also massive, there's also like, so, so, so I, think, I think with this, the gamma yeah. you get, get of impermanent loss, your exposure to Aave, it's like leveraged. It's yeah. super, it's super. Yeah, it's a, I, I just find this yeah. like, you know, how like um, these um, things play to Perfect. be very interesting. So David, yeah. is, is all staked Aave invested into that balancer pool or just some portion of it? Or is that a separate entirely sort of loop? Uh, uh, so it's, it, uh, it's a, as far as I understand, it's a, a separate, it's a separate one. It's because to, to do that, you're staking um, the, the LP token, like Aave, uh, uh, balancer. But wait, like if you just have regular Aave and you deposit it, turn it into staked Aave, is, does that go somewhere? Does that go into the balancer pool? And it sort of automatically gets the bow rewards and trading fees and then increases the amount that goes back to reward the stakers? No, in the staking pool, no, no, not, not at the moment. Okay. No, no, no. So, so there's the option to stake just purely Aave and then you get staked Aave in return. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's like a, that, that, then you receive um, uh, interest through, uh, through uh, fees in the market. Um, and then there's an the option of, if you want to also do the balancer pool rewards as well, which has high interest, but then also maybe there's other associated risks as well. So, so, you, so you, you, guys, you, guys, you guys have a DGEN mode for, for your <laughs> for DGEN mode for. <laughs> yeah. For people that want to maximize, let's say, their yields. Um, <laughs> What's PSI mean yeah. there? Where it but, says receive yeah. PSI and Aave protocol fees? Uh, PSI, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I should know this. Let me. Um, protocol safety insurance or something? Incentive. Sorry, yeah, protocol safety incentive. Gotcha. So that's like a flat amount that's paid regardless of whether there are any Aave protocol fees, presumably. It's something like out of some sort of reserve fund. Um, no, I have to look into those details. I should probably know that. <laughs> but yeah, let me let me get back to you on that. Um, but yeah, so so we do have uh, Arvenomics docs as well. So uh, um, 
I think you can see this. I can do um, Rvnomics. So if you're interested in the whole sort of governance mechanisms, uh, you can go here and yeah, there's a safety module, the same diagrams, but it's much more detail um, than what we've just gone over in this call. Gotcha. All right, I'll try and um, finish up quickly. Um, and the, the, the main part of code I was gonna show you around the governance uh, was that this is how you stake through code. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. We have the Aave token, uh, the staked Aave token, it's also, it's an ERC20, but also uh, you, you can do your staking and claiming through that. Um, so you can claim rewards. Uh, and then also part, part we didn't want to encourage uh, DGEN behavior too much. So when you stake, uh, there's a cooldown period. Um, so, so, you know, you can't just suddenly rip out your um, staked Aave. Um, just on a whim, there's like, a, at the moment, it's a 10 day cooldown period. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, and so it's is, been pretty good. This, yeah, so far. This is, this, this, this is interesting. And like the first thing I've seen do that is empty set dollar. So they, they have this kind of like, um, like, you know, a circuit breaker in that, like mm -hmm. they have epochs and you can only perform one action at, within a, a, any, um, any given epoch. So like, you know, this, this stuff like this also stops like um, from a risk perspective, it stops like things from moving, you know, breaking or moving too quickly. So like yeah. in, in, one, in one epoch, you can either add liquidity or remove it. So, so like, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's pretty interesting. It is pretty that's, that you guys are doing this and you're also the ones that have flash loans. So you have the instant stuff and then, hey, let's <laughs> <stop> <laughs> <reasonable> here. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, but uh, both sides. But you know, it's a, uh, it provides utility, I guess. <laughs> um, that, that's sort of the, the main uh, content part of, of all the presentation. I have these other slides, which is more examples of, you know, what other people have built. You know, are they, um, one interesting thing I'll highlight is are they gotcha, which, which is pretty cool. Um, doing NFTs and underlying it is A tokens. So interest bearing NFTs. Uh, and they're not on mainnet, mainnet yet, um, but I think they'll deploy like that. Actually, it's a game. Like a, you have gone quest and then experiences uh, and things like that, um, probably next year. But yeah, that's, that's there's a lot of interesting things being built, uh, both like strictly DeFi, like DeFi Saver, and things like Avagachi or even Yearn, uh, and then for a combo. I mentioned that flash loans is only for developers; it's not end users. Uh, for end users, but tools like for a combo that allow end users to uh, create, basically stick these Lego blocks together. So. Um, here you can, you know, do a Aave flash loan and then take those funds and swap on Curve. And, you know, you just connect these blocks together. So that's really cool from an end user perspective. So it allows non-developers to utilize flash loans. Is this manual execution? Like it, you only do flash loan of the time? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, you, where you click the transact button, then it will basically turn this into a transaction and execute it. So, um, but I've, he I've heard that some people can actually get arbitrage opportunities this way. Yeah, because I was wondering that, that in reality, how much opportunity you can get in manual. Like uh, I just created a kind of app graph bot to kind of monitor the uh, index scope that talk I mentioned earlier. And for the last three months, there's only five minutes of opportunity where it, it was profitable enough. <laughs> so if people are just sitting here, I wonder yeah. how the people can actually be profitable. Exactly. You're part of the dark forest, man, Monoko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, just, you, just, you just wait for Coinbase to mess up the die price. And it happens once every year. Exactly. But, but yeah, so, so there's, that, that, there's like black swan events, like the die price. Um, oh, there's, um, for, the major, for the major tokens, you won't, Get it because it's like you said, it's like less than five minutes. But for like, let's say there's unheard of coins, um, you know, you can find like other charge opportunities that way if you're hunting. What kind of coin? Of, like just some random coin that's not super popular. Oh, you mean shit coins? <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> some call them shit coins. Yeah, but, but, you know, but, but, you guys, opportunities. but you guys will list them. 
We need more. We need more shit coins on. We need more <laughs> shit coins on that. <laughs> we'll leave that for the other protocols. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no. Um. So, uh, besides arbitrage, sorry, we're just going uh, trying to finish off this footer combo part. Uh, is that, uh, you know, I, I talked about the collateral swap. So you can also, you know, build these sort of collateral swap things. Like, let's say if you're using some sort of lending protocol, uh, and you want to do something in one transaction. Uh, this is where Fura Combo was being used previously when gas prices were really high because people didn't want to like do various transactions to close a position and they could just set it up using flash loans and Fura Combo, then it's one transaction. Um, I see. Yeah, so it's not just like profit seeking, sometimes it's just like saving your positions. Um, do you yeah. have to, sorry, do you have to uh, deploy a new contract for combination or you can reuse a set of stuff? Like, I was well, worried about how much gas overhead of that kind of desolation. Yeah, for, for a combo, uh, I'm pretty sure you're just making a contract call, uh, okay. you know, and you, they're, they're encoding the call and then, you know, they've already set up certain adapters for Uniswap, for Aave, for whatever protocols. Um, yeah. So I think it's pretty gas efficient. Um, yeah, on this slide, there's, yeah, of course, the resources. Um, I think the main things is uh, the docs are pretty pretty good. Um, both the developer docs, there's risk docs as well, which go into the risk parameters and how the risk team thinks about that. And also there's the, the governance docs, um, which which are quite interesting as well. And of course the governance forum that you can check out. This so, yeah. is kind of a random question, but is are, do you guys have any inclinations toward um, having a, a layer two um, implementation? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so we've, we did announce that for v2 we'll have uh, layer two um some sort of layer two integrations um it won't be in the initial uh release of v2 but we'll we'll definitely investigating it and, and plan to have it uh in in you know an eventual iteration of v2 mainly around uh you know trading a tokens and things you like know, that to begin with have they decided where it's going to be built on or is it going to be built in-house or uh, so it's not going to be built in-house, but um, I mean, we're not going to build our own layer two. We're going to utilize, you know, one of the layer twos that are, are existing, um, but we haven't announced anything on which particular L2 or, you know, side chain or whatever uh, yet. We're, we're, we're actively on, investigating uh, multiple ones. Come on, come on, uh, Alpha Leak. Let, let give, us, <laughs> give, us, give us one, 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 four final, one final gift. <laughs> No, no, I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> that we're on XI right now. Do you any kind of wing? Yeah, yeah. The current. True, I, I've, I've looked at. I've looked at uh, XI, um, but yeah, mm. I haven't looked too closely. But I've, I've, I've looked at the various, like many different uh, LCs. In, in terms of the uh, kind of layer two, mm -hmm. something like you know XI or probably even Matic, you just deploy the exact kind of copy of what you have in V1. So there's, it's just a separate universe, but in certain way, do you guys con take into consideration of some sort of cross chain composability or integration somehow possible? So like- Yeah, if, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so when, when I'm having these sort of conversations or, or researching it, what I'm, what, what I'm thinking about is, um, you know, both how easy it is to deploy. So, you know, can we just deploy our solidity contracts? Do we have to modify it? Do we have to re-audit brand new code? Um, and then also it's the composability aspect. So, you know, it'd be great if uh, we could use flash lines on L2 um, or if, you know, someone could use, uh, you know, features. Because most of it, a lot of our users, they don't just use Aave. They, they it's all cross protocol things. Yeah, um, so if it's technically possible to have a cross chain flash line in general, uh, potentially, uh, I don't know if flash loans in particular, um, but I know for there's some L2s, there's some L2 group, working group that's working on interoperable L2s. Yeah. Because, um, because the core of flash loan is just batch job, right? So I, I, I wonder if it's possible to batch operations in different chains in one transaction. I don't know uh, if it's possible. Yes, I was talking to some, some people about this. Um, potentially, I, th I think potentially. I mean, maybe if you have two separate L2s uh, and you have some Oracle that, that's reliable that says, okay, this transaction has started and this transaction oh. has ended. And then, you know, check whether it's been paid back on. 
have you have you have you looked have you looked at them the workout of connect it's, it's so apparently have a conversation with them and it's like um so they they um they uh use state channels to do something like that with um across different l2s which is um which is which seems great for um composability but i haven't looked on the looked um, beneath the... yeah there's a lot of like exciting technologies out there um the yeah, there's, so there's the composability, interoperability aspect, but then also there's the scalability aspect as well. Um, you know, our thing is like, how decentralized is it? You know, like if we start, if if a lot of like, if billions of dollars start migrating to some L2, you know, that also becomes another like risk factor for us. Folks, you scare me. I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> okay, I think uh, it's about time, maybe, do you guys have any single last question or? No? Okay. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. So thank you so much uh, for, you know, this one uh, workshop. I, I really enjoyed like, you know, we could bombard with uh, all sorts of questions and uh, I'll, I, I'm recording this. So I'm going to put that on YouTube so people can, sh you know, watch it later. So please help like, you know, spreading and I want to finalize so you don't forget to take the stake back. And also in the event page, there's a Telegram channel link. So if you haven't joined, please join us. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for future topics people want to do, like interactively do, you know, do something like this. So like if you have any suggestion, I'm yeah, particularly interested in how you use Balancer for various different use cases. So maybe that could be a different topic or something. But thank you very much, guys. Okay. Thanks, so Thanks for having me, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That's right. Bye.